Good morning. And welcome. Welcome to worship this morning. Yep, there we go. And welcome to worship this morning. It's a joy to have you with us here today. A special welcome to those of you joining us online. Uh, thank you for coming out here today to worship the Lord Jesus Christ and for braving yet another long day of constant rain. Huh? One of these days has got to stop, I figure. Uh, if you've been joining us for the first time, you'll notice inside your bulletin we have the Connect cards. If you take a moment and fill that out, uh, on the front is some contact information, a way for you to connect with us and us to connect with you. And on the back are some next steps of faith. Please go ahead, fill that out now. Turn it into the ushers during the gathering of the offering. If you have someone that you'd like us to pray for as part of our service this morning, you'll see that in the pews in front of you there are yellow prayer cards. Please go ahead, fill one of those out now, and then give it to the ushers during the singing of this first hymn, and they'll get it up here to us. A couple of announcements I wanted to highlight. You can see that we have a congregational meeting that is coming up at the end of the month, a congregational meeting coming up at the end of the month. Uh, also, our church picnic will be about a month or so from today, and tickets are already on sale out in the lobby and then later on in the church office. We have a number of different uh, service opportunities, a number of different ways to get connected, like Habitat for Humanity, taking it to the streets, Sunshine Team, the greeters here at our church. I also wanted to highlight Grief Share. Grief Share is a program that helps people who have experienced a loss in their life, uh, that people can come together and share together, walk alongside each other so that you're not walking alone. And we have two grief share opportunities, one in the day, one in the evening. And I want to let you know that the evening one is also being led by one of the men of our church. Uh, because men, when you lose somebody you love, it's very hard. And especially for men, it's a time when they feel alone. They have no one to speak with, no one to understand. So here's an opportunity to walk with someone who does understand. There are a number of other announcements, but I encourage you to check those out at your convenience. We've come to worship the Lord Jesus, and therefore let us pray. Lord God Almighty, Lord God Almighty, you have gathered us in this place at this time that we might come and worship you. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come in the power of your Holy Spirit and move among us. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears. Let us hear what you are saying to us in your word and let us respond with trust, with obedience, and with praise. For we ask this Jesus in your holy name. Amen. And our service begins with our brief order of confession and forgiveness, which is found on the screen above us and also on page 77 in the green hymnal in front of you. If you would please stand as you are willing and able. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us now confess our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot forgive ourselves. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. 
Let us share peace.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. There once was a man named Abram, who was a descendant of Noah. God told him to move with his wife Sarai, an entire family away from where they lived. God made a promise, I will make you into a great nation and bless you, and all of the people on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram and his family left. At one point, they stopped and God told him to look around. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your children. Then, one night, God took Abram outside. Look up and count the stars. This is the number of children you will have. But Abram was already 75 years old, and Sarai was way too old to have children. So they decided that Sarai's servant Hagar should have Abram's child. Hagar became pregnant and gave birth to a son named Ishmael. Yet, God told Abram again, you will be the father of many nations. 
God changed their names to Abraham and Sarah and promised that it would be through Sarah that God's blessing would come. Exactly as God promised, Sarah became pregnant, giving birth to a son named Isaac. When Isaac was still a young boy, God told Abraham to take his son up on a mountain and sacrifice him. Abraham took Isaac, laid him on an altar, and took out his knife to kill him. But an angel stopped Abraham, and God provided a ram to sacrifice in place of Isaac. Years later, Abraham and Sarah died and left everything they owned to Isaac. Isaac married and had twin sons, Jacob and Esau. Esau was Isaac's favorite, and as the oldest, he was set to gain his father's inheritance. But Jacob wanted the inheritance, so he came up with a scheme to trick his father, who was now old and blind, into promising it to him. He dressed in Esau's clothes and put animal skin on his hands because Esau's hands were very hairy. Confused, Isaac gave his blessing to Jacob and promised him the inheritance instead of Esau. This caused a huge fight, one that almost ended in murder before they went their own ways. Thankfully, they reunited and God promised to bless Jacob's family. Jacob had 12 sons of his own. And like his father and grandfather before him, Jacob had a favorite son. Little did Jacob know that his favoritism would put his son Joseph in danger of being killed by his own brothers. All right, so what do you think? Kind of neat, isn't it, the way he does that? I preach this morning in the name of God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So last week we began a sermon series, a new sermon series for the year called The Story. And we will be preaching and teaching and reading our way through the whole Bible as a whole church family for the whole year. And if you haven't already picked up your copy of The Story, please do so today. And we have copies waiting for you out in the gathering place at the information desk. But we want to get the story into your hands because we want to get God's word into your heart so that the Holy Spirit can work upon you there. And the story began last week, we began in the beginning. And I made the point that the story is God's story. The story is God's story. It's the story of the God who made us, the God who loves us, the God who wants us back. And last week we ended at the point when God made a covenant with Noah. And I made the point that that was a turning point in the Bible. That from there on out, the story would be driven ahead as God would make covenant after covenant after covenant with his people, binding himself to his people with a promise. And we pick up the story today when God makes another such promise, this time to a man named Abraham. So if you would, please open up to page 13, to page 13 in the story, and let's follow along. Page 13. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And this too is a new thing. This too marks a turning point in the Bible. No longer will God deal with the whole world all at once, as he did first by sending the flood, and then by making a covenant with everything left on the face of the planet, never to send another flood again. No longer will God deal with the whole world all at once, but from here on out, God will focus on this one man, Abram, and through this one man, Abram, God will bless all the peoples on the earth. God will redeem the whole world through him. And why him? Well, we don't know. We're not told. But it's all by grace. By grace, God chose Abram and God made a promise to him, a promise in three parts of land, of children, and of blessing. Go to the land I will show you. I will make of you into a great nation with many descendants, and through you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And Martin Luther once wrote that the whole rest of the story of the Bible 
is simply the story of how God is faithful to this promise that he made to Abram and how God worked this promise out in the end. And it's all by grace. By grace, God made a promise to Abram by faith. Abram obeyed, and faith is defined for us on the bottom of page 14 at that footnote there. Faith is complete trust, complete trust. And Abram had faith like that. Abram had trust like that, complete trust in God. God told Abram to go, and Abram went. Now leave your finger here, because we're going to come back to this place. Leave your finger here and open up with me to the inside cover, to the maps on the inside cover of your book. And you can see on the map where it says Assyria. Right by the initial A in Assyria, right by the first A in Assyria, that's more or less where Abram was living when God appeared to him and said, go from your country to a country that I will show you. And so Abram went, first heading west toward the Mediterranean Sea and then heading south until finally God said, stop, this is the place. Flip back with me to page 14 at the top. Now by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. But Abraham traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. Right? This is it. You can stop right here. So by this point in the story, Abram is already being blessed by God. Abram is already in the land promised by God, but Abram still has none of the children God promised him. And after about 10 years in the promised land, Abram was starting to get a little bit anxious and antsy, middle of page 15. After 10 years in the promised land, one night Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me? What can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, you've given me no children. And so now a servant in my household shall be my heir. Abram is anxious and once again God appears to him and God promises to do what God had promised to do. And the word of the Lord came to him saying, no, this man shall not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood, he shall be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. If you can count them, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Abram believed the Lord. Abram had complete trust that God would do what he said he would do. And so Abram is called the father of faith, an example for you and me. We are his children, of, uh, we are his children by faith. And though Abram's faith is heroic, yet his faith is lot, a lot more like yours and mine than might at first seem. For though Abram had faith, real faith, genuine faith, complete trust in God, yet Abram also kind of hedged his bets a little bit. If you read carefully, you'll notice there on page 15, God promises a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And after about 10 years without kids, Abraham started to think, well, he didn't say anything about Sarah. If I can't have children by Sarah, then maybe I should have children by someone else. And so he does. He puts his servant Hagar to use as a surrogate mother. She bears him a child. God says, hey, nice boy you got there. I like him. I'll bless him. I'll prosper him. I'll even call him donkey boy for you. But he's not the one. He's not the one. Thanks for your help, Abram. Thanks for your help, Sarai, but I can take care of this myself. You just, just wait. And so they do. For 14 more years, they wait. And then, top of page 17, when Abram was 99 years old. Now, God had first appeared to Abram when he was 75 years old. It has been 24 years. 24 years since God made his promise to Abram, and yet there are still none of the children that God promised him. 24 years. When at last God shows up and promises again, and this time God seals that promise with a covenant. Top of page 17. I am God Almighty, and I shall make my covenant between me and you, and I will greatly increase your numbers. Middle of the next paragraph. 
I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you and the whole land of Canaan I will give as an everlasting possession to you and to your descendants. And then the next paragraph, every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. And remember, a covenant is a solemn promise spoken by God, sealed with a sign. The promise is the same, land, children, and blessing. The speaker is the same, the Lord God Almighty. But this time there is a covenant with a sign, the sign of circumcision. And ever since this day, for the last 40 centuries, God's own people have been marked by that sign of the covenant. But when Sarah first heard of it, she laughed. She laughed to hear that God at last would deliver on his promise. But you know what? God got the last laugh, didn't he? And God gave them a son, Isaac, whose name means laughter. For when Abraham and Sarah saw that at last God had delivered on his promises, how they must have laughed with joy. Middle of page 18. And Abram, Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has brought me laughter. And everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. God's grace is perfect. God has delivered upon his promises. God's grace is perfect even though their faith was not. But their faith was good enough. And their faith is an awful lot like you and me. Because you know what? Like Abraham and Sarah, we too can grow awfully impatient with God and his promises. His promises to bless us. His promises to protect us. His promises to provide for us. His promises to give us a hope in a future. His promise to free us from the grip of our past. His promise to give us life and give it to us abundantly. God makes promises to us. And God will always deliver upon his promises to us. But sometimes he doesn't do it as fast as we want him to. And sometimes, like Abraham and Sarah, we are tempted to take matters into our own hands, if not force the hand of God himself. Sovereign Lord, what can you give me? What can you give me since I remain childless? Let me give you an idea, God. How about Eliezer of Damascus? Why don't we adopt him? No, how about Hagar? Huh? Let, let, let me help you out, God. But you know what? God doesn't need our help. God does not need our help. God wants our faith. God wants our trust. God wants our obedience. And like Abraham and Sarah, we have to learn to wait patiently upon him. For when God makes a promise, he will always deliver upon that promise, but in his own time and in his own way. And sometimes that may be 24 years. God's grace is perfect. Our faith, not always. And both of them were put to the test in the sacrifice of Isaac. Middle of page 19. Now, sometime later, God tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. And you may be thinking to yourself, that sounds barbaric, and you're absolutely right. But remember, this is the 21st century B.C., People really did practice human sacrifice back then, and more to the point, we live in the 21st century A.D., and half our country thinks we have the constitutional right to sacrifice our children now. Barbaric, yes. But the horror is not in what is being asked to be done. The horror is who it's being done to. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, whom you have waited for these past 24 years, who I, the Lord God, have bound myself by covenant oath to, 
through whom I have promised to bless all the descendants, all the people on the face of the earth, through him, take him and sacrifice him as a burnt offering. The sacrifice of Isaac is a test of Abraham, yes, but even more so, it is a test of God and of his grace. For how can God deliver upon his promises if God takes away the promised son? How can God bless all the peoples on the earth with the descendants of Abraham if there's not a single descendant of Abraham to bless them through? The sacrifice of Isaac is a test of Abraham and a test of God. And both of them, both of them pass the test. Abraham passed by faith, top of page 20. Abraham passed by faith, which is complete trust that God can do what he said he would do, though Abraham does not see how, though Abraham sees no way out, yet Abraham has faith, top of page 20. The fire and the wood are here, said Isaac. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham passed by faith, God passed by grace. When God did provide the lamb for the offering, middle of page 20, Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over, he took the ram, and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. And this is the very first time in the Bible that there is a substitutionary sacrifice. One life offered in the place of another. One life offered instead of another. It occurs for the very first time here so that the sacrifice of Isaac is a foreshadow of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. When God himself did provide the lamb. And when God himself took his son, his only son, Jesus, whom he loved and gave him up for us. God's grace is perfect. And the sacrifice of Isaac put both God and Abram to the test. Both, both passed the test. But poor Isaac, huh? I mean, seriously, poor Isaac, right? His own dad tried to kill him. And then later on, his his wife and his son would conspire against him to lie to him, to manipulate him, to to steal the inheritance right out from underneath his nose. And his twin boys, who we are told on page 21, his twin boys, who we are told that he and Rebecca waited 20 years for, for 20 years, for two decades, he and his wife prayed for these boys. God at last gave them to them in answer to prayer. And what do they do? They grow up to hate each other's guts and want each other dead. What a disaster. I mean, his life is just a complete mess. Though he is blessed by God, though he is chosen by God, though he is literally the promised son of God, though he is blessed by God himself to be a blessing to all the peoples of the face of the earth, yet his life is a complete train wreck. And his family, the so-called holy family, is like a hot mess. It's like reality TV before it's time. Just a complete train wreck. But you know what? God's story never goes off track. Because God is not a character in Isaac's story. Isaac is a character in his. And God's story never goes off track. Now down here in the lower story, where you and I and Isaac live, down here where life is the way that we experience, down here life is full of its twists and its turns, its highs and its lows, its ups and its downs, its wrong turns and its dead ends and its cul-de-sacs. Down here we have to walk by faith and not by sight because we don't always see the big picture. But the big picture, that's the upper story. That's God's story. That's the unfolding of all things according to God's plan. That's the outworking of all things according to God's promises. That's the upper story, and the upper story never goes off track. The upper story never gets diverted from its target. Even when down here in the lower story, things are a train wreck like they were for Isaac. 
Even when down here in the lower story, God is working through some unsavory, ethically challenged people like he did with Jacob, who is the consummate con man of the Bible. I mean, just take a look at him, right? Who, me? He innocently pleads even while stealing someone's sheep. The consummate con man of the Bible. And you know what? He had no reason to be, absolutely none. Because even before he was born, God had blessed him. While he and his brother Esau were still twins in their mother's womb, God said, Jacob, I have loved. Jacob, I have chosen. Jacob, I have blessed. He was blessed and chosen by God even before the moment of his birth. And yet Jacob spent his whole life trying to take, trying to steal, trying to grasp what God had already given him by grace. And so Jacob tricks his brother to get the inheritance away from him. Jacob and his mom scheme together against their father to steal the blessing away from him. And even after he's got that blessing in his hip pocket, even 20 years after he's got the blessing in his back pocket, top of page 22, even 20 years after he's got that blessing in his back pocket, yet Jacob doesn't really believe he's got it. Doesn't really believe it's his. Doesn't really believe God has blessed him. Not until the bottom drops out of his life. On the one hand, his father-in-law, out of from whom Jacob had stolen half of his flocks and herds, and on the other, his brother Esau, who's coming to kill him with 400 armed men, caught between a rock and a hard place with nowhere else to turn. Jacob turns at last to the God that he had been running from his whole life. Bottom of page 22. And Jacob prayed, O God, God of my father, Abraham, O God of my father, Isaac, Lord, save me. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, because I am afraid. Save me. And in answer to that prayer, the God who made him and loved him and wanted him back met him and challenged him and broke him. Bottom of page 23. And after Jacob had sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, all alone in the dead of night. Jacob was left alone alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. And that was no man. That was the angel of the Lord. That was the presence of the Lord God himself. Jacob had spent his whole life running away from God. And that night when the bottom fell out of his life, at last Jacob encountered God face to face, and Jacob wrestled with him. Jacob wrestled with him all night long. And though Jacob prevailed, yet God won the victory. God won the victory. For God gave Jacob a new name, Israel. God gave Jacob a new life. Middle of page 24. The murderous meeting between two embittered, embattled brothers that everyone had feared turns instead to a foreshadowing of the return of the prodigal son. Middle of page 24. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him and threw his arms around his neck and kissed him and they wept. God gives Jacob a new name. God gives Jacob a new life. God gives Jacob a new heart. Top of page 25. And so Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, get rid of those foreign gods you have with you, then come. Let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. God, Jacob spent his whole life running away from God. And at last, Jacob realizes that God was always there. Wherever he had gone, there God was. What changed? God didn't change. Jacob did. Because this is God's story. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they're just characters in it. 
and God's story is still going on, you and I, we're characters in it too. And what is God saying to you today? What is God saying to you today? How is God changing you? What does God want to give you? Is God giving you a new heart like Jacob? To turn to him, to believe in him after so many years of running away. Like Jacob, have you been running away from God your whole life? Like Jacob, do you find it hard to believe that you have already been blessed by God? Then like Jacob, stop running. Stop running from God. Stop hiding from God. Instead, encounter God and wrestle with him and do it today. Don't let the, the bottom fall out of your life, but do it today. And start with the same prayer that Jacob prayed. Oh God, save me. Save me. Is God giving you a new heart like Jacob? Is God giving you new eyes like Isaac? To see the mess and chaos and confusion of your lower story in the light of the beauty and plan and purpose of God's upper story? Is God giving you new eyes like Isaac? Is God giving you time like Abraham? to test the impatience of your faith against the certainty of his promise, to perfect your imperfect faith as he provides for you by grace. What is God doing to you today? Martin Luther once said that the whole rest of the story of the Bible is simply the story of how God is faithful to this promise that he made to Abram and how God works things out in the end. And the story is still going on. You and I are characters in it. What will you do? Amen. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you and we praise you. Lord God, we thank you and we praise you that you have given us your holy word. And Lord, your word is not, it's not just history, God. It's a story, a story that you are still telling to us today. And Lord Jesus, open up our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts and our minds that we can see ourselves in your story. And Lord Jesus, when we are impatient like Abraham, teach us to wait. When we are grasping like Jacob, God, break us. And Lord, when our life is a complete mess, give us the eyes of Isaac to look beyond and see your plan and purpose at work in our lives. Lord Jesus, we are your people. Open up our eyes to see and then give us the faith, the trust to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, our service continues with our confession of faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. If you would please stand as you are willing and able. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, we come to you today giving you all of our praise and giving you all the glory. We praise you for your majesty, your power, and your sovereignty. We praise you as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, for we know that all comes from you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
Father, we also come to you today with thankful hearts. Thank you for provided us and continue to provide us. Thank you for the recent rains. Help us to be good stewards of those rains that you have given us. And Lord, we also thank you for the freedom to worship you without threat of persecution. Thank you for claiming us as your own through your message of the gospel. But most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on that cross to take away our sins and open our way to heaven. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious God, thank you for loving us so unconditionally and being so faithful to us, even though our faith at times may be weak or imperfect. You established a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all who worked wondrous things through you. Keep our ears open to hear your voice each new day. And we pray that your Holy Spirit guide us because we know that you do have a plan for each of us according to your perfect will. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, you've also called us to abide in your word and to remain steadfast in our faith. Thank you for giving us your word, which we can keep in our hearts and grow it by your Holy Spirit. Deepen our understanding so that by your power we can spread this gospel and stay strong and never be moved from our faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, this morning we lift up all those who have been affected by Hurricane Florence. Please continue to protect them, give them comfort and strength as they slowly begin to recover. Lord, we also pray for the first responders, the rescue teams and the recovery teams as they continue to work, not only this weekend, but in the future. Keep them all safe as they take care of those in need. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Father, today we lift up our elected officials. We ask that your wisdom guide them and that all their decisions will glorify you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Father, we continue to remember and lift up all the men and women who are serving in the armed forces around the world. Especially today, we lift up Josh Bitsky, Forrest Boss, Morgan Boss, Luke Jordan, Michelle Jordan, Ryan Harada, Mark Baker, Arthur Waltrip, Rusty Nail, Connor McEtron, and Brad Turnbaugh. Lord, please protect them and keep them safe until they return home safely to their families and friends. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, today we have so many people that we know who are in need of your special care and healing touch. Lord, this morning we lift up all those who are in residential care. We also remember in prayer this morning Clinton Shield, Ralph Herman, Gary Grist, Carrie Aguilar. Lord, we can also lift up those who are ill. Carolyn Walden, Elizabeth Markle, Pearl Hilrich, Judy Stewart, Jim Shields, Francis Laba, Gayla Finch, Skip Stephenson, Vanell Magers, Lloyd Cabras, Rain Golka, Cindy Anthony, Don Lasker, Carol Pearson, Jackie Ben Ben, Jennifer. Bernice Hanks, Jean Carnes. Lord, also this morning we lift up those who mourn. We lift up the family of Effie Mae Davis, 
family of Mike Kennedy, the Shirley Goforth family, the Sells family at the loss of their son Peter, Skip and Linda Stephenson on the loss of Linda's brother. Lord, just comfort them with the special care that you can give them and wrap your arms around them as they continue to mourn and just ease their pain. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father God, today we also lift up our congregation here at St. John's. You commission us to go into the world with the promise of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for Pastor Eric, and Pastor Mariola, and all our council members, and all who serve you by serving in some way in this congregation. We lift them up this morning and ask for your continued guidance, and that your Holy Spirit leads and speaks to them and that all that they do glorifies your holy name as we all continue to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as we now worship the Lord with our offerings and the choir will saying, uh, good, good father.
It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Please be seated as we now come to the celebration of Holy Communion where Lutheran Christians believe, teach, and practice. The communion is what our Lord Jesus tells us it is. It is his own body and blood given to us in, with, and under the bread and wine, given to us freely for the forgiveness of sins and for the gift of eternal life. Therefore, all who believe in Christ and have been baptized into him are welcome to come forward and to receive his body and blood. And today communion will be by intention. You'll receive the wafer and then dip it into a chalice of either wine. We also have grape juice available here at the center aisle. And we have gluten-free elements available upon request. Communion assistants, please come forward.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is the God of Abraham Praise.